Again, 20,000 people have disappeared in Alaska since 1970. And now this is a massive number when you take into consideration how big the population in Alaska is. It materializes and with all these lights and they're trying to be quiet. He said, if you make any noises, this thing is going to go ballistic. S twigs snapping anything. We're not just talking about ships arriving from the skies now. We're talking about potential bases underneath the water that these craft are coming out from. But you know, the question is, what the heck is going on in Alaska? John, how you doing? Hey, doing good. Doing good. good. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I am not sure if we found a part of the world that isn't weird. Um, it seems like every time we start looking into any old state or town or could be place in Europe, could be Af anywhere we look, there is a ton of weird stuff going on. And Alaska is a very, very strange place. I mean, John, did you, I don't know if you knew this, but since 1970, about 20,000 people have disappeared in Alaska. Whoa, that's, that, wait, how does that work out up against the population? I mean, are we talking about people who've gone to visit? Are we talking about like general population? Because as far as I know, Alaska is not that populated. That's a lot of people. And then and then and I, then it makes me think, like, what are the statistics on other states as far right. as missing people go? Right. I mean, we're we're I don't have statistics on like how that compares to the national average in other places. And I think a lot of people are like, well, it's Alaska. Like it's probably the it's got the worst weather or, you know, the coldest weather. It's very treacherous in Alaska, you know, a very dangerous place. But we're not hearing of Canadians going missing that much. And, uh, you know, well, like, you know, there is, there is the thing about, um, Canadian native women missing. Actually, a lot of native native women have gone missing so much so that there are, um, grassroots groups popping up in order to try to understand what's going on, where are they going, who's taking them, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that at least part of that is coming out of Canada too. Really? It's, it's, yeah, it's a big deal. It's actually a big deal. You, If you do a search on it, you'll find institutes like uh, trying to figure out what's going on and, you know, charities for the families and stuff like that because they just like up and disappear. And the the um, percentage is way higher than any other race. Yeah. I think we're going to need to do a show on that. We That's... will. We had viewed that. Yes, we viewed that. Really? Oh, Yeah. All right. Well, we can't later, man. It's just yeah, we, <laughs> we have a whole lot of weird plan for you guys in this episode. Never mind what John just said, but it has to relate to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here. I mean, again, 20,000 people have disappeared in Alaska since 1970. And now this is a massive number when you take into consideration how big the population in Alaska is. Right. Right. You, I mean, we're talking about, okay, so I'm finding here where I'm looking right now that this is over double the national average. So we do have some statistics of people going missing. This is over, over double the double? national average. Wow. Yeah. Right. And okay. you know, I, you know, most people are just going to be, well, yeah, Occam's razor. So it's, it's, it's literally going to be weather, uh, bears just getting lost. Yeah. But you know, I mean. Okay, but we're talking about seven. So the population of Alaska is about seven hundred and thirty three thousand, give or take a few people. Um, and it's not just people going missing. That's really odd in terms of statistics. But we have a staggering sixty five hundred reported UFO sightings 
in Alaska. Again, this is like the other thing. It's like like when you get to UFO sightings, most sightings obviously for obvious reasons occur in more populated areas because you need eyeballs in order to make the report. So that's a lot of UFO sightings. Dude, that no, <laughs> for, that's not for, for very little people. Okay. For very little people, you're talking about so many less people having to see whatever right. it is up in the sky and then go through the trouble of reporting it. Now, if you compare this to Florida, the amount of the amount of UFO sightings in Florida in 2015 was about 5100 from one source that I saw. This is less what? than Alaska, but we're talking about one of our most populated states in the entire country. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like you have hundred. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions more eyes on the skies in Florida. And we have that few sightings compared to Alaska, where we've got 6,500 sightings and only 733,000 people there. Right. Right. And and think about how many people aren't reporting stuff in Alaska because they're just like, people are going to think I'm crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, the 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 actual percentage of people who do reports, who put reports out or send reports, sorry, to MUFON or whomever um, is probably in the maybe lower than 10%. Right. <laughs> right. It's important to kind of qualify here that when we say a UFO sighting, it doesn't mean alien craft. It just means something people reported seeing in the sky that they do not recognize as normal air flight, normal yeah. patterns of air flight that we see on a daily basis, like planes, helicopters, and those things, right? And some of the sightings are are really weird. And there's one here that I kind of want to go over. But you know, the question is, what the heck is going on in Alaska? We know that there's a lot of like military bases in Alaska, right? Um, Obviously, there's a lot of military activity out there. We know that this is a strategical place for our military because of its proximity to, you know, China and Russia. Soviet Russia, most notably, is when they acquired Alaska, right? So, you know, is it because of that that we're seeing so many UFOs or is there a correlation here between these things? Right. I mean, you have like, thousands upon thousands and whatever acres um, of land that's uninhabited in Alaska with which they could do whatever they want. You know, it's like, it's like Nevada. I mean, like, what is it? Like 75 ish percent of Nevada is owned by the federal government. And yeah. it's just so barren, open and empty that nobody would want to really live spread out across Nevada anyway. So the government has so many, have you ever driven through Nevada? Yeah, you probably have. Like I have every time I, yeah, every time I drive through Nevada, because I'll take these crazy routes through Nevada that go in the middle of nowhere. I just get vibed out. Like you wouldn't believe on just weird stuff that's going on out there. Really? Just, you could feel it in the air. You know, you could feel it in the air from, uh, basically probably black project sites at the very least, at the very least. Well, and, and so, yeah, that's is... probably a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it, if you think about it, it's sort of like the other side of the same coin of as Nevada, where Nevada is like barren desert. You've got in Alaska, barren, you know, land and yeah, it's got so tundra, cold. Tundra, tundra right. To, to, to the treed areas. Yeah. Right. Okay, so um, we all know that that um, Roswell, the the crash that happened in Roswell, happened in um, 1947, right? I believe it was July 8th, 1947. Just the day after, on July 9th, 1947, three teenage Anchorage girls, their names were Judy Kerr, Kerr Vicky Novak and Nancy Green claimed to see what was a very strange disc shaped object. Now, this was above Elmendorf, which is an Air Force base. And oh. it, streaked, it streaked across the sky and then disappeared um, to the south of that. Now, according to these girls, this UFO 
traveled at a great speed and was moving faster than ordinary planes. These girls also claimed that it was smaller than any fighter plane and not a weather balloon. They like singled out that it was not a weather balloon because they were familiar with weather balloons since they were all daughters of servicemen and past, you know, the time it's 1947, like watching base flight operations. Right. So these right. girls made this like documented UFO sighting and it's the day after the news breaks at Roswell. Now this means one of two things. One is, Everyone's freaked out after Roswell. And so a lot of people are making claims of UFOs or there was a tremendous amount of activity in the sky after or around Roswell. And this was just one of the various, you know, um, reported UFO activity that we have record of. But I found this report, check this out. In 1945, two years before the Roswell crash, it was reported in uh, Alaska that a disc flew out of the ocean. It was a naval ship that spotted it, and it was worried it would provoke an attack, so it held back firing. Fourteen members of the crew witnessed it, and because the craft basically circled around it two to three times, everyone was basically able to see it, and then it flew off, right? Right. And this was an I, I like because I, I was doing all kinds of different research. I was looking at articles. I think one of the History Channel shows that I watched that was about Alaska was talking about this one incident with this naval ship in 1945 that ended up seeing this disc emerge from the ocean. Now, yeah. which is also really, if you think about it, this is really crazy too because we're not just talking about ships arriving from the skies. Now we're talking about potential bases underneath the water that these craft are coming out from. And now that could be, again, it could be alien. It could be military. I, I don't care. I don't even know. I just, but it's like, what is going on? You know? Right. Other reports here in 1950, a U.S. Navy pilot recorded a UFO going over 1800 miles per hour. I mean, 1800 miles an hour compared to the speed of light doesn't sound like even comparable, but 1800 right. miles an hour is ridiculously fast. I mean, yeah. um, I, I mean, if you compare that to, I mean, in 1950, how fast our planes could fly. And then you're, you're tracking something going over 1800 miles an hour. Right. That's gonna, that's gonna shock you, you know, now, um, in Ketchikan, Alaska, I hope I pronounced that right. If y'all are out in Alaska, um, there's a, a, a super high amount of UFO sightings out there. And, you know, residents in this area, they have a good view of 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 the sky uh, and the ocean, you know, because they're right off. It's kind of one of those islands on the I don't know what you would call it. The pan elevations. Yeah. Like that yep. little area by yep. Juno that's coming down. So there's a uh, an artist and resident. This guy's name was Terry Piles. He was also a former wilderness guide. These details are important to mention because. You know, we're talking about a guy who's a wilderness, a wilderness guy. He's very familiar with, you know, the terrain of, of Alaska, trying to bring people through it. Um, and he's an artist, so he's visual. And, you know, some of his paintings were like really quite good. I mean, of like wolves and different things. Right. And um, in 2013, he goes out on his deck uh, with his wife and they're just chilling out there. And all of a sudden in the distance, where there's like, you know, hilly terrain, he sees like a, an object just comes straight down from the sky and it looks like fire orange, right? So he's out there with his wife and he, he's, he picks up his binoculars immediately, right? It takes off and another one comes down right after it. All right. He pulls his binoculars up and he gets a close look and he can see that like the, I guess the metal uh, uh, on the on the disc, whatever it was, was almost like molten and like moving around and stuff. And it was and it had lights and the lights were moving around the disc and following one another around the disc. And then it took off in the same going the same direction as the other craft at like a pretty high speed, you right. know? So there's like there's people 
that you can see and listen to talk about these things and they're in their right mind and they're talking about seeing something that they can't explain in in great detail i mean the fact that he i haven't heard many people that have been like i spotted a ufo i was able to pick up my binoculars and get a closer look and this is what i saw right not many people well i mean i think the the description of it and what he's what he is what he saw i mean that's very strange because i think most people without lifting binoculars to it would probably think well just at first glance it's a meteor coming down because of the right. fiery stream that's flowing and, and and you have to wonder like how is that technology different from for instance what the pentagon showed with the you know the little tic tac things like how right so how is that technology different from that if it is even different or if it's in another rendition of its process of moving. I mean, it's weird because yeah. some people do describe UFOs like that, like this fiery ball, but Hey, there's like yeah. lights and windows on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it's not, maybe it's not hot. Maybe it's just a transition that the UFO is going through, or maybe it does internally, um, heat itself in order to change like change shape well you, you know, know i mean there are like in in a lot of cases when people see the glowing the the glowing and you've got the field around it that is it that's part of the propulsion system like we've seen that with remote viewing like that's caused by the propulsion system and the displacement of gravity in an electromagnetic field um so that's like the that is part of it but then when you get to the thing that looks like a ball of fire like what's going on there? You know, what is right. that? Yeah. Yeah. I've never, I've never really heard, um, you know, I mean, he's quoted as saying a glowing ball of what appears to be fire, right? Like some kind of molten metal. And then he also said a cauldron of molten metal with lights chasing, um, one another around the rim of the disc. There was no noise. Yeah. No noise at all. Really strange. Yeah. These, these reports are like way more than you can find at least a dozen other reports that are like basically saying the same thing, same general description from all over the world, at least, at least a dozen, probably way more than that. And, and those are just what people reported like 10 ish percent of actual sightings. Oh, dude. Dude, the craziest thing I found. I've got to tell you this. Like, there's two insane things that I found. One was, you know, okay, there's a lot of people that that study um, these cattle mutilations, right? Sure. Because cattle mutilations that are happening are, they're really bizarre because they're one of two things. One is it's satanic rituals that crazy people are doing and they're using the particular body parts that are being cut out of these animals and the blood for some type of ritual. The other claim is that these are UFOs that are, or I should say alien uh, experimentation that's going on and they're dropping the animals off in different places. You know, we get a lot of animals going missing and then the animals will appear somewhere randomly and they're, like precision cuts are made to cut out their genitalia. Yeah, like a laser did it. Right. Like a laser did it or something like that. Just, but it's way too precise to be anything normal. Right. And now this is the story that I found that was in 1978. There were a couple of hikers that were out. Um, they wake up in the morning. One of the hikers basically sees something in the distance and it's a flying saucer that comes down. And now we're talking about a half a mile away from them. So he wakes his buddy up and he's like, yo, we got to go check this out. Right. So they they get up, they, you know, they run over to where the, they saw this or this guy saw this disc go down when they get to the landing spot that, you know, he thought is where it landed. There was no craft, but there was where the craft would have landed a moose, a bear a caribou and get this a killer whale 
We're, ta- we're talking about oh, hundreds serious? of miles from the ocean. Whale? A killer whale. Hundreds of miles from the ocean. All yeah. had precision cuts in them. Yeah. And and it's, it's like, like hundreds of miles from the ocean, a killer whale? Right. That's I've, insane. Okay. I've never heard of like a killer whale just being dropped off in the middle of the mainland United States. And we're like confounded by how it got there. But like right. this is Alaska, you know? Right. Right, right. You're talking about something that people have not seen before. Like, I mean, yeah, we see the cattle, but a killer whale that's with, with precision cuts. That's really fascinating. Wow. I had never heard of this story. Now, another thing that, that I saw, this was also really interesting that I wanted to tell you about. Now there's a guy who lives in Alaska. His name's Tim Ackerman. And in January, 2019 okay tim ackerman this guy he's a hunter okay and he's i believe at least part native okay and now he sees this circle uh that's made from something landing and melting the snow in this certain area okay and he looks at the the tracks around it and he is just totally baffled by what he's seeing now the circle is 32 feet across and he's never seen anything like this before. And he's a he's a tracker. He's a hunter himself, right? And he sees f- uh, footprints in the snow that he's never in his life seen before. A hunter who's never seen tracks like these particular tracks before. And the way that he described the tracks were really interesting because it wasn't just tracks that like every... He, basically, the way he described it is every single walking animal or mammal on this planet has to drag their feet a little bit through the snow as they're moving forward. These tracks, the way that they were put down, went straight down and then came straight up, <laughs> leaving no trail of moving forward. Interesting. Yeah. So kind of like stomp walking. Yeah. It's basically like, like they're, they're it's like the, whatever it is, the hooves, the whatever is just yeah. sticking down and they likened the tracks to some type of lizard being huh. that might walk like that. But of course that's a stretch. How could you know? But I don't know. They would, they've seen more stuff than I have. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And so now these, these, uh, 12 separate, uh, landing areas that created the full circle. They had photos of and everything. Uh, it was really interesting to look at. And what was even more interesting than that is that later on in this episode, Tim Ackerman, this guy, he brings you out to a, a, a place in remote Alaska in the same town where there are native drawings in red ochre on the rocks in like the wilderness there. You know, they were a little unclear exactly where these were, but because he's native, he knew where they were, where they were. And what was super interesting is that in on these rock formations, you know, there was like, you know, a man on one of them or like a spirit uh, thing that had been drawn. There was a salmon because salmon is like the most common fish that's eaten in that area. And then there was a, a wheel on one of the ceilings of the rock. And he was like, you have to understand why this is weird. He's like, the natives in this area did not have wheels. There's no wheel technology here. They were trying to draw on the ceiling of this rock. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that that uh, wheel actually shows up in a lot of petroglyphs, um, usually um, across the southwest um, of the United States. So it's it's something. But yeah, so... That was like, that kind of blew my mind when, you know, it went from him seeing these strange tracks, you know, and then going and being like, this is what I think it was, because it was like that circle with the (laughs) spokes on it on the rock was next to another formation that was a cross. And there has been reported sightings also of craft in the sky that are shaped like a cross. Right, right, right. Well, you know, then you have, you know, you've got people like Pat Price, um, who was one of the early remote viewers in the <clears throat> CIA program. Yeah. When it was in development through at Stanford Research Institute, he was like, he was a very talented remote viewer. He was, 
he was a he was a guy who could actually at times read words on paper psychically which is a very rare thing because the whole phenomena of remote viewing is more right-brained general descriptive side than actually you know seeing that kind of stuff so he was a very very talented guy and he, he was one of the viewers that was used <clears throat> very early on in the project in order to prove it to the cia and to get more and more funding to create the program and um, he, like, for whatever reason, I don't know how he came across this or how he he got tasked on this, but he <clears throat> basically saw a UFO base, an alien UFO base in Mount Hayes mm. in Alaska. I was just going to ask where the location of Mount Hayes is. Mount Hayes you know is, where is it? It's like near Fairbanks. In a, okay. It's like, it's like this borderland zone of mountains between <clears throat> some of the more populated areas like Anchorage and then the rest of Alaska. That's just like nothing. Right. Right. So, so he had remote viewed what he said were four different alien bases on the earth. Um, there were a couple of different other locations across the earth and he specifically had focused on Mount Hayes saying that within there, is a is a ufo base that aliens are currently um uh working in so basically what he saw in that place was he said it appears to be a weather and geological center and has similar security measures or security measures to prevent discovery he described computer equipment and followed leads on an oscilloscope which led to a small box-like structure which contained rotational antennas that sat on top of a mountain peak, that mountain peak, um, and it was part of a detection system. So he's claiming they have a detection system on the mountain in order to know if anybody's like getting near it. Uh, he thought that, he felt, remote viewed, that the place was um, a place where new recruits would come to um, and, and basically, um, monitor what's going on earth and using it as sort of a control center for coming in and, um, uh, others coming in and getting resources from here and being able to like, you know, have this as, as an outpost. And he described them as being, um, human-like or humans, um, mm. but different heart maybe bigger eyes, different heart, different lung system, um, but looking very human-like, like they could pass as humans. So he, because he was such a good remote viewer, this like particular thing was given to um, people in the program uh, that were running the remote viewing program that they likely tasked on later as well, right, to verify it. And in fact, we had remote viewed the same thing. Like we remote viewed what, he was talking about and yeah, absolutely. Like you're talking about a team of remote viewers. There is a base in Mount Hayes, but not just in there. There's like others, there's around, all around there. It's not just limited to that. And because you get into an area that is so expansive and deserted, they're going to have locations there. And what you often find, if you have some kind of well, UFO base, or if you have some type of black project military installation, you will find these two are pretty close to each other. Now, right. whether the humans set up close or they have mm, connection with them, with a, one some specific race, like uh, like alien race, and they work with them, then they'll set up their own thing. So you see this sort of thing go back and forth and back and forth. And it's behind a cover of secrecy, a cover cover of darkness, so much so that just by me saying this makes me sound like I'm completely, utterly nuts, right? Then when you get into, you know, the disappearing people, especially the native women's, it makes me sound even more nuts. I don't know. That's fact. You've got data on that. Like, <clears throat> yeah, but I the mean, fact that... is that a lot of the people that go missing are related to those things taking the people oh i and get that that, that, that I makes mean, it even more crazy that makes you sound crazy but right. what i get why that makes you sound crazy but what makes what baffles me is 
like are we real like are people as a whole really that unintelligent that they don't put two and two together like it's not that hard to say well hey we've got this area here where more people are going missing than anywhere else i'm not saying it's like you don't have to admit or even believe that it's alien in nature at all but it's like something must be going on there then what's going on like right. start there at least right if this guy was telling the truth and if there was really something going on then the fate of pat price probably wasn't a very positive one was it well yeah okay so pat there's a lot of mystery around his death he died uh not long after that it was in the 1970s that he died so he had yeah he he had a meeting in in dc so he flew to i think he lived in um on the west coast i think california well obviously he was probably living around san francisco menlo park because of the program and he had had to fly to um, dc for a meeting with the naval intelligence service as well as a, a, some other agency and after that he flew to salt lake city and then to las vegas to meet with some people that he knew and when they got him the people he knew got him from the airport and took him to uh, the Stardust Hotel, somebody in the hotel bumped into him. Now, people don't know if it is something or isn't something. It just was an anomaly. Somebody bumped into him. And later on that night, he started to have very strange things happen, happen to him. He started to go into, I think, convulsions. He started to have problems going in and out of consciousness. Um, and eventually, he died just that night he died and they say it was a heart attack but he had no previous history according to the person who was with him of heart condition and so a lot of people think that perhaps it was the russians that killed him um because of the program that was happening at sri and how good he was uh, <laughs> It's it's we haven't viewed this particular thing. So that's um, one of the ideas. The Russians killed him because of that. Well, I can see that happening because of what they were doing. These programs, they're layered, right? Like they're layered. What you see on the surface isn't 100 percent what's going on under the surface. Something else is going on. We know that. Um, mm -hmm. And and what they were working on was was pretty much akin to what the Russians were doing in that they were trying to figure out ways of communication, energy frequencies, frequencies of telepathy, stuff like that in order to, one of the big things was to actually communicate with submarines. Because right. when, when there's communication with submarines, there are signals, you know, uh, low frequency signals, mm -hmm. right? That they, that can be picked up. And so the communications can be picked up. So they have to figure out a different way to communicate with them. And one of those things that people were really trying to figure out was what's the frequency of telepathy, right? How can we use that? He was so good at remote viewing that I'm sure he was part of it. Now, but obviously he was meeting with naval intelligence, right? Um, so, so it could have been them, but it also could have been somebody else afraid of his abilities because remote viewing and people with these types of abilities is a threat to power structures in general, whether that power structure is across the ocean or your own power structure. Um, so, or he could have had a heart attack, truly had a heart attack. Well, that seems... You don't know. Some people you. even think that, that, that his death was faked so that the CIA could take him into, they, you know, sheep dip him basically. Um, yeah. And, but this wasn't the only remote viewer that you're aware of that's had some strange stuff right. going well, on. Right, we've got about... Ingo Swan too, right. right? So he and Ingo Swan worked together. Um, and Ingo was basically the godfather of remote viewing because he was responsible for creating the coordinate system, like the, the whole tasking method. Yeah, pretty brilliant. Yeah, he was brilliant. Um, artist out of New York. And so Ingo, during his career, um, he had somebody from, I think it was, he said somebody from, uh, the Senate or somebody new in Congress or something gave him a call and said, somebody's going to be contacting you. Just do what they say. Uh, all right. 
forgot about it. And then he's contacted by a person that he calls Axelrod. And the person said, I need you to do a special remote viewing project for me. When can we pick you up? Or can we pick you up? Or we are picking you up right now. Get in the car. Basically put a hood over his head, took him to some like remote oh, underground facility. And it's just him remote viewing things. Like like that guy Axelrod is acting as his monitor and Wait, having so this is few things, right? Th is this where the infamous Axelrod came into like, I mean, we I've heard of this guy on multiple right. different things. It's not his real name, right? It's right. not his real name. But yeah, this is the infamous Axelrod. And so, you know, he's got Ingo, he gives Ingo coordinates and Ingo's remote viewing and Ingo realizes that this is the moon. I'm remote viewing the moon and he's getting to structures and he's, he's basically describing himself freaking out because he never considered aliens and structures on the moon at this point in time. And this was, this was, um, I don't know, maybe before Pat Price's remote viewing of alien bases, it could have been this whole event that got Pat Price to remote view alien bases here on earth. Mm. And so. So Ingo's remote viewing these things and getting structures and describing all these structures that Axelrod is, is going after while Axelrod monitors him. And eventually Ingo remote views what he perceives to be a non-human life form within the structures. The moment he does that, Axelrod gets completely freaked out, pulls him off of it and said, did he notice you? You have to tell me, did he notice you? Did he notice you? And, and, and Ingo's freaking out. Like, what is this? What's going on here? Because this was like mind breaking for him, you know, right. a whole new concept and idea and, and how scared Axelrod was of the situation on top of it all. Right. Because Ingo hadn't considered it. And the way Axelrod was acting was like, this is a huge threat and it's very dangerous, even dangerous from the standpoint of remote viewing. Right. You are not the quiet ninja that you think you are when you're remote viewing other life forms. <laughs> so so he goes through all of that. He gets the data from Ingo. Ingo goes back to work. Axelrod goes away. He gets a phone call later from Axelrod saying, we're going to want to take you somewhere. We're going to pick you up at this time and place. So he gets picked up, hood over his head. They put him on a jet along with Axelrod and two guys that he claims were twins. He was very tripped out about these guys, possibly clones, but they were like super soldiers that were always around Axelrod. Mm. Um, and they flew weird. for a while. What's that? This is weird. This is weird. So they flew for a while. The, Ingo didn't know where he was going. He wouldn't tell him where he's going. Axelrod only told him that you're going to see something when we get here. So they fly all, all night and they land early in the morning before the sun is rising in some cold treed location. They get in a car, drive dirt roads for a long time, get to a location. It's still dark, right? The sun's not coming up and they hike from that point. They get to a place behind a big, huge rock and there's like this lake in front of them. And, and so it's Axelrod, the twins and Ingo all hiding behind a rock. And then Axelrod says, watch the lake at a certain period of time. This form starts to appear over the lake. It starts to manifest, materialize, right? It materializes and with all these lights and they're trying to be quiet. He said, Axelrod had told Ingo that if you make any noises, this thing is going to go ballistic S twigs snapping anything anything and so they are watching this thing materialize and start to suck up water and it's a ufo shape just right over the lake just sucking up water and at a certain point a noise happens somebody moves a, a twig snaps and this thing starts shooting out lasers and firing lasers and trees are getting obliterated no yes it, it was based off of the sound so any sound even an animal would get obliterated by this thing protecting itself absolutely no one is to know that this thing was there obviously and they're hiding behind the rock so at that point they have to start running 
because they don't know if it, 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 it hurt them or an animal in the woods or whatever. They have to run. So they took off. They got out of harm's way, out of danger. And on the way back, when they went back to the airstrip that they landed at, it was, it was now morning light. And there was a plane that said, mail, Alaska. So this location, probably with pretty much certainty, is in Alaska. And so what, we, what we're seeing here, like we remote viewed this too. Like we remote viewed this story. This, this story did happen. This did happen to Ingo and his experience. And there is so much going on up there, right? And, and I'm guessing that, that because of this experience, Pat Price decided he was going to look into, well, are there bases on Earth, right? And because he did that, that remote viewing material made its way out into official channels. But it's so much more than just the four locations that he viewed. I mean, I have received coordinates of location of a location in um, Alaska that is not Mount Hayes, but in the general region of another one. Denali? Right? Near Denali? In that area, yes. Yeah. Yes. That so, area is supposed to be a hot spot. Right, 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 right. So so we're talking about land with no people. It's very easy to set up shop there and get resources as well. Of course, you got cold, but on the other side of that, you've got rivers, lakes, et cetera, et cetera, to pull resources from. What the heck, dude? That, that story is nuts. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Well, you, you got to ask the question. Why did Axelrod get so concerned when he know, when he thought that perhaps one of the aliens had noticed Ingo during the remote viewing session? Why did he get so concerned? What experience did Axelrod have in the past with psychics, remote viewing aliens, and, and Axelrod knowing that if the aliens notice the viewer, bad things are going to happen, right? That's crazy. The implications right. of that are. You can actually watch. I did a video on that. There's a. I've got a video on Rise TV where it's where it goes into that a bit and and why Axelrod uh, knew and what his experience was. <laughs> oh, so this is an episode on Chronicles of a Psychic Spy. In part, there's a little bit. Yeah, it's it's like I just went into the Axelrod thing because uh, we had viewed like what experience did Axelrod have to to know this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys, you guys watching right now, uh, if you want to support John and my work, you can actually get a subscription to Rise.TV. You can watch John's series, Chronicles of a Psychic Spy. And uh, I have tons and tons of series on uh, Rise.TV um, that basically will keep you watching for oh, hundreds yeah. of hours. It's like endless like, content. It's, yeah, it's, it's like, incredible over there. It's like five, like over 500 videos it's it's out of control now yeah and um, stuff's always being posted there always yeah yeah for sure uh but this has got me super amped up because next episode we're gonna have to try to answer the question why are there all of these ufo sightings in alaska what's in alaska or more importantly what's underground in alaska and if you think this episode was crazy just wait until we go through what we found, because it is opening up a can of worms that you can really only open up on this show, metaphysical. We we end up finding stuff and metaphysical. Uh, we go now, there. <laughs> we really do go there. And the other thing is, like I have to say, John, you and I have both been doing this work for a really long time, but consistently, when you and I are working together we come across things that we're like, how have we never heard of this before? I know, like, I'm thinking like there's all these Mandela effects happening or something. I don't know I what's don't going know. on. And <laughs> no. it's like- How did I not know this? I think, and I think like the only reason I think maybe we can find some of this stuff is like, we're just constantly researching and then it's, everything ends up getting connected over time. And then we're just, we're never going to run out of stuff to- I know we do videos on it's 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 pretty crazy, but we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please leave us a comment uh, in, you know, the comments below. Let us know what you thought. If there was any questions that we didn't answer that you guys would like us to answer, we could potentially do on a future episode. Um, and for everyone out there supporting us, um, thank you so much. And again, if you'd like to support our work, you can go to rise.tv and uh, get a subscription over there. 
uh, it's pretty pretty inexpensive uh, and you'd be helping us out a lot and um yeah john did you have anything else to add before we um stick around (laughs) (laughs) yeah stick around stick around is a good one all right well you guys i hope you guys thought this episode was as out of this world as we did 